I would be tomorrow chairing today, chairing this session on Lukacs. And I was chatting to somebody afterwards and they said, what's that about? You know, I thought you were a GP. How come you're talk, you know, chairing a session about Lukacs? So I said, well, that's actually a long story. <laughs> but um, just to, by way of introduction to Tim's uh, lecture on Lukacs, perhaps I'd give you a br brief highlights of that story. I'm part of that generation uh, that came of age politically in the great revolutionary upsurge of the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, it was the end of the post-war boom. There was a big uh, outbreak of trade union militancy across Western Europe. There was the upsurge of the student revolt, Paris, May 68. Women's liberation, gay liberation, black power, national liberation movements around the world. There was a great sense of the possibility of major change in society in that period. By the mid-70s, however, it was obvious that that forward wave had reached something of a, of a crisis, that the, 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 there took place certainly in Britain across Western Europe to a, some degree of stabilisation of uh, the capitalist order, a sense of the, the weakness of the labour movement, the main agency which people looked to as the main force for the possibility of revolutionary change had proved to be much weaker than people thought, and the left was left disoriented very considerably as a result. And it was evident, I think, to many of us that if we wanted to change the world, it would require a deeper grasp of the dynamics of capitalist society than uh, was held by most of the people engaged in these sort of activities at the time. And that we needed to advance a bit beyond Marx's slogans, which were very much of the uh, popular of the moment, towards a deeper study of Marx and of Marxist theory uh, to try and develop uh, Marxist theory in relation to contemporary society. It's quite interesting. One interesting of that period of, you know, I say I was of a generation that was radicalised by, by that experience. Interesting, the change in the concept of the word radicalism or being radicalised over the last few years. People get, rad to be radicalised now is to be the object of something. Somebody radicalises you or, you know, if you're uh, the, ben the beneficiary of government programmes, you could even be de-radicalised and people complain that, uh, that uh, you know, the, 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 you know you're the parents of people have been radicalised, that they've actually been brainwashed. But people are the objects of those processes of changing their consciousness rather than, in our, we radicalised ourselves in the, uh, that period. There was a sense of, of uh, the possibility that the, 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 the radical, radicalisation was a subjective uh, 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 moment. And this dialectic of subject and object, I think, would maybe something which Tim will become to uh, 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 return to later as a very substantial element of uh, the discussion of Lukács. So, in that period of the mid-70s, many of us returned to a, or, or sometimes for the, mainly for the first time, to a proper study of Marx and Engels, of Lenin and Trotsky, who gave continuity to the Marxist tradition into the 20th century. Although we found great difficulties then in the degeneration, of, though we were very instinctively anti-Stalinist, the degeneration of the Trotskyist tradition created a real intellectual, political problems that had to be tackled. One of the people that I recall vividly, and I'm pleased to see there's some people in the room who went through this experience with us, will also recall uh, a man from an older generation of radicals, Dave Halsworth, who rather sadly died a couple of years ago, who came from a working class trade union background in Manchester and was very much an autodidact of a tradition that's rather sadly enfeebled. But he took to the study of Marxist theory with a great enthusiasm and he had a way of referring to people in the Marxist tradition with great sort of affection, uh, that he had sort of assimilated people into the tradition of the working class almost as a, a sort of honorary members of the British working class. So he would refer to Marx and Engels as Charlie and Fred, as though they were intimates uh, of his. Uh, and another person that uh, Dave would occasionally refer to in these sort of discussion, discussions was old Georgie Lukács. And people may have noticed some of the transliterations of Lukács' name is spelled with a Y from the Hungarian. So some of the editions have just George with a G. So it's fine. And Georgie Lukács was the way in which Lukács was assimilated into the traditions of the British working class, but in the mind of Dave Holsworth at least. But it's an interesting illustration of the sort of influence that uh, Lukács had in the 
that development, our attempt to develop Marxist theory in relation to the contemporary moment of British capitalism, particularly in terms of trying to give an organisational expression to the mo movement to transform capitalist society. So that's how I became, and we became, uh, the people involved in that movement at that time, became interested in George Lukács as one of the key figures, a transitional figure in the Marxist tradition between the early days of Marx and Engels and Lenin and Trotsky and the contemporary period. And on that note, I'll introduce Tim Black. Tim is the uh, reviews and books editor of Spiked online magazine, a man I think who needs no further introduction. Tim. bit of a nerve-wracking moment there uh, with this piece of technology, uh, which I'm only using because the printer uh, is broken at work. Um, so I'm actually not going to start immediately uh, with history and class consciousness, uh, but with the intellectual and political story of the young and youngish Georg Lukács, or uh, Georgie, U Georgie Lukács, I think I should probably refer to him from now on. Um, and I'm going to start with the young Lukács because I think it's illustrative um, I think it shows how he was wrestling uh, with a complex of problems to which was to find a solution uh, in history and class consciousness. Uh, problems such as the alienation of the subject from the objective social world, uh, a sense of fatalism uh, and an impulse uh, towards voluntarism. So Lukács, you know, he's born in 1885. Um, his family is Jewish but Hungarianized, you know, so they've adopted Hungary's national language and culture. And it's a wealthy family. Uh, his father is the, I think he's, he's the head of the Hungarian bank at one point. Um, but the comfortable, relatively liberal world of Lukács' parents, the world of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, is coming to an end. Um, Lukács' formative years are those of uh, Findusiek Central Europe, complete with a bit of uh, anti-Semitic conservative nationalism thrown in for good measure. And likewise, his kind of formative intellectual influences are rich in uh, sort of mainstream Findusiek modernist sentiment. Uh, in an interview in the late 1960s, he talks of finding a copy of Max Nordau's Degeneration in his, in his father's library and finding snippets from Baudelaire and Nietzsche, which confirmed to him uh, that society was sickening, uh, that it was decadent. And I think this sense of, so uh, of, uh, of societal decay, this sense that there was something wrong with the modern uh, bourgeois world, infused Lukács' thinking right from the start. It's, it's always there. And uh, as he says in the 1967 preface to History and Class Consciousness, he, al he always hated capitalism, you know, long before the working class. That's almost seems to what he seems to be implying. Um, but what's interesting in, the, in, in his early pre-history and class consciousness works, this opposition to the world as it is, uh, to capitalism, takes on the form of an ethical radicalism. It's informed by Kant, uh, by Fichte, and later uh, Kierkegaard. And it's dualistic as well. There is an objective world over there, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's estranged and it's separate uh, from the ethical subject over here. Over there is what is, and over here is what ought to be. Uh, and this leads either to fatalism and despair, or to utopianism and voluntarism, uh, an aggressive paradoxical idealism, as Lukács describes his early positions. So take Soul and Form, uh, which is published, I think, in 1910, uh, a collection of essays written during his stay in Berlin while in his early 20s. Um, in almost all the essays there, uh, Lukács is wrestling with the opposition uh, of, of, how, of how the world is. It's soulless, he says. It's inauthentic. It entangles life in a thousand threads and a thousand accidental bonds and relationships. Uh, and how it ought to be essential, a communion of souls, he says at one point, a world soaked in meaning. Uh, but he can find no bridge, if you like, no way to overcome this estrangement, uh, this estrangement of the soul from the world in which it might be able to realise itself. The only solution he can find, and it's one that's there in German idealism and Nietzsche as well to a certain extent, the only sphere, if you like, in which a soul might be able to give itself a form is in art. That's where the opposition between a soul yearning for meaning and an objective form in which that meaning can be realised is overcome. Or to give it its more kind of Kantian inflection, it's the point where the ought can become the is, where something approaching an ethical life can be realised, not in the sunken world out there, but in the, this higher world, the uh, sort of ethereal world of art. In 1910, Lukács settles in, in, in Heidelberg, which at this point is probably the cultural centre 
um, if you like, for the German-speaking world. And it's there he meets Max Weber and becomes quite close to him. Um, Weber, incidentally, was always a little in awe of Lukács, despite being the older man. He told Paul, Paul uh, Honigsheim that after speaking to him, Lukács, I'll be thinking about it for days afterwards. Now, Weber plays a significant role, I think, in the development of Lukács' thought, and certainly history and class consciousness. From Weber, Lukács takes on and develops the idea of rationalisation. Uh, and what is rationalisation? It is the idea that under the impulse of Protestantism, uh, particularly Calvinism, men started to subject their worldly activity, their labour, to rational forms of calculation, timekeeping, stock, uh, stock taking and so on. And they did this in order to prove to themselves and others that they were worthy of salvation, that they were predestined uh, for heaven. But, and this was Weber's sort of melancholy twist, courtesy of Nietzsche, rationalisation, which was once a means to achieve the end of salvation, started to become an end in itself. So the world was rationalised, all right, but it was godless, it was disenchanted. Uh, Weber's vision is, is melancholy, and you can hear its echo at points in history, in history and class consciousness. And this is, uh, this is, uh, this is Weber. Uh, the rationalised economic order is now bound to the technical and economic conditions of machine production, which determine the lives of all individuals who are born into this mechanism. Perhaps it will so determine them until the last tonne of fossilised coal is burnt. In English Protestant Richard Baxter's view, the care for external goods should only lie on the shoulders of the saint like a light cloak, which can be thrown aside any moment. But fate decreed that the cloak should become an iron cage. Uh, can you pass me a little bit In other words... Um, in this idea of this iron cage of rationality. Um, Weber provided Lukács with a deeper, more economically flavoured vision of the modern world. At the same time, though, there's still no sense of how the world is. It is a world in which men are subject to the instrumental reason, if you like, of rationalisation. It might be transformed, although that's not quite true. In fact, the Weber circle, including Lukács, actually turned to Russia long before the Russian Revolution. They turned to Russian mysticism, uh, they turned to the Orthodox Church, and they turned in particular to, to uh, Dostoevsky. They turned to them as an alternative uh, to the rationalised, disenchanted West. Lukács even marries a Russian woman at this point, whom his friend Ernst Bloch calls Lukács' Russia, his Dostoevsky in Russia, which didn't exist in, uh, in reality. It was a very short-lived marriage, as it turned out. And this is also the reason my theory of the novel, which is Lukács' most significant pre-Marxist work, published in 1914, ends with an appeal to Dostoevsky. In the work of Dostoevsky, in particular the character of Alyosha and the brothers Karamazov, and the nearly and the uh, near saintly figure uh, committed, sorry, this near saintly figure committed to doing good, and also in the redemptive climax of crime and punishment, Lukács suggests that there is a, there are possible signs of an actual redemption from following Fichte, mm -hmm. the age of absolute sinfulness, uh, or as it's otherwise put, the age of total degradation. But again, despite the greater sense of history in the theory of the novel, in which the novel, the epic of a world abandoned by God, represents a subjective questing, if you like, after, after meaning in a godless world, uh, uh, which the, and the world no longer yields uh, a meaning, uh, the dualism of Lukács' thought persists. To the dead, disenchanted world, Lukács is still only able to offer up an ethical rejoinder, an ought. It ought to be redeemed. It ought to be a world in which humanity is at home rather than estranged. Uh, during the war years, he moves from Heidelberg. Uh, so he flits between Heidelberg and, and Budapest. He establishes a, a group of intellectuals, including Karl Mannheim in Budapest. They discuss Kierkegaard. Uh, they praise Dostoevsky. Uh, they reject uh, social democracy. And they long for some kind of uh, cultural rebirth, some kind of uh, huge sort of mass cultural redemption of the sunken world. And then, of course, things happen, or rather history happens, or rather the Russian Revolution happens. Uh, as Lukács puts it, puts it, the Russian Revolution really opened a window to the future. The fall of Tsarism brought a, glimpse, uh, brought a glimpse of it, and with the collapse of capitalism, it appeared in full view, at last, at last, a way for mankind to escape from war and capitalism. Uh, closer to home for Lukács, the, hung the Hungarian government um, collapses at the end of the war. Um, then an interim uh, coalition government falters, and with social power lying 
uh, abandoned in the street, as Luk Lukács puts in history class consciousness. Uh, the Hungarian Communist Party, formed by Bela Kuhn towards the end of 1918, takes control in March 1919. The Hungarian Soviet is born, and Lukács, who's joined the, uh, the, Hungarian, uh, the Hungarian Communist Party at the end of uh, uh, 1918, is named Deputy uh, Commissioner for Public Education. Now, what's fascinating about Lukács' thought at this point is that not that much has really changed. Uh, he formulates the question of revolution in terms that reproduce the dichotomies of his earlier work. It's just the, the tragic side, uh, the sense that the objective, human in, in, sorry, the, obje the objective in human reality... Uh, sorry, I'll tell it again. It's just the, tra the tragic side, the sense that this objective in human reality, which resists uh, the subjective impulse, has been replaced, if you like, by an ultra-voluntaristic side. The subject can simply make over reality in its own image, just like that. Um, take, for instance, Bolshevis uh, Bolshevism as a moral problem, uh, which he wrote in 1918. He writes, In the moment of decision that has now arrived, one cannot overlook the dualistic separation of the soulless empirical reality and the human, that is the utopian, the ethical objective. As it happens, um, in, November, in November 1918, when he writes this essay, uh, Lukács does not want to join the Communist Party. Um, he does not want to be part of what he considers to be a violent, forceful revolution. He doesn't want to hurt people, seems to be the kind of principal motive. Uh, he says the act would be unethical. Uh, can freedom be attained by means of oppression, he says, rhetorically? Should one drive out Satan with Beelzebub? And of course the answer is no. No, one shouldn't drive out Satan with Beelzebub. Um, by the time of the article's publication, however, which is December 1918, Lukács has joined, the, has joined the party. He rushes home to tell his friends that he's met Bella Kuhn and he's, de he's decided that Bella Kuhn, in Bella Kuhn the truth uh, is incarnate. Bella Kuhn embodies the truth. He's just completely switched. Um, and actually, uh, his little group of friends, because they all joined the Communist Party together at this point, were known by one of their kind of political competitors, competitors as the Ethicals. That was their nickname. They were known as the Ethicals. Now, I think it's fair to say the Hungarian Soviet is an education for Lukács. He's thrust into the political realm. He's in the midst of trying to change the world, putting his theory into practice. His ethical rejection of capitalism, his ethical rejection of the world as it is, has now become part of the struggle to change the world, to overthrow capitalism. Um, as the Czechoslovakian army moves in, in in April, I think, 1919, Lukács is put in charge of the Hungarian Red Army's 5th Division, and they successfully launch a counteroffensive. Uh, but the Hungarian Soviet was always kind of up against it. Uh, the, Ro the Romanian army, backed, I think, by the French, is circling. By August, the Hungarian Soviet's collapsed. Uh, Bela Kuhn flees to Vienna. Uh, Lukács actually remains behind in Budapest at this point uh, to organise an underground opposition. Uh, but his co-collaborator is arrested, so Lukács himself flees uh, to Vienna. And it, you know, it's actually quite a relative, it's a relatively exciting flight. Um, Lukács poses as a chauffeur, but there's one huge flaw in this, in this genius scheme, and that's, he, that's that he can't drive. <laughs> um, So he puts his arm in a sling and he pretends he's actually injured himself and he gets the German officer to drive him, the injured Lukács, the chauffeur, across the border. And it's in Vienna, because that's where he's fled to, it's in Vienna that history and class consciousness takes shape. It's where he begins to reckon with his early positions, with the dualism of his pre-communist thought and the dualism of his and his comrades' thought in the Communist Party. He reckons with revisionism, he reckons with opportunism, he reckons uh, with a conviction, uh, he reckons with a belief in the iron laws of economic necessity. Uh, he, he reckons with the idea of, of, uh, that workers will spontaneously uh, develop consciousness. Uh, he sees the fatalism, uh, yeah, he sees the fatalism, the determinism in all these kind of phenomena. And I think what Lukács develops, I think what, you know, it's, what, it's particularly striking reading today, what Lukács develops in history and class consciousness, consciousness is a thoroughgoing critique of dualistic th forms of thought. And by that I mean he seeks both to show why subject and object stand in rigid opposition to one another, why individuals can confront the human created world as an alien world operating according to what appear to be its own natural laws, and how this rigid opposition can and should be overcome. That is through the dialectical method, through the grasping of social reality, not as an agglomeration of achieved things, but as aspects of the process of production. 
And this method, this struggle to grasp the forms of the objective world as the creations of a social subjectivity, this struggle to make reality self-conscious, is one and the same with the struggle of the proletariat to become class consciousness. Sorry, to, be class, to become class conscious. Now, why do subject and object stand in opposition to one another? Why does the world appear to operate according to its own alien, inexorable laws? This Lukash attributes to reification and the reified structure of consciousness of men under capitalism. And what does reification mean? It means that what is a relationship between people appears as a relationship between things. More than that, it means that individuals, proletarians, proletarians and bourgeois alike, experience themselves not as subjects of a societal process of production they control, but as the objects of natural laws which control them. OK. Now, Lukács' concept of reification is, of course, an acute reading or rereading of Marx's theory of commodity fascism, in which, thanks to the dual character of labour under capitalism producing exchange value as well as its use value, the product of labour, the, the commodity, through the act of exchange, acquires a quality, if you like, an agency, all of its own. Prices rise and fall, the labour market expands and contracts, profits increase and decrease and so on, and the whole economic cosmos not only appears to operate according to its own laws, but holds individual humans in its thrall. But what Lukács then does is interesting. What Lukács then does with the theory of commodity fascism is interesting. He looks at how reification, indeed alienation, affects men's consciousness, how it conditions the way in which they approach the world, the way in which they seek to understand it, and here we see the irreducible dualism with which Lukács had long been battlism, the dualism of subject and object, of form and content, of voluntarism and fatalism, indeed of uh, opportunism and economism. Or as he calls dualism in history and class consciousness, the antinomies of bourgeois thought. Now this is a, this is a fascinating section. In some, in, in some ways it resonates more today than I think other sections of history and class consciousness. Uh, what Lukács attempts to do in the section, The Antinomies of Bourgeois Thought, is to understand modern rational philosophy, roughly from uh, Descartes or Spinoza onwards, in terms of an attempt to bridge the gap between the world as it is and the world as it ought to be, to make the real rational, to, 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 to quote Hegel. Now, in the progressive, confident phase of bourgeois thought, which seems to be, if you read Lukács, it seems to be sort of roughly never quite, around the 18th century, strange enough. Um, the, yeah, now, in the progressive, confident phase of bourgeois thought, suggests Lukács, when the class felt comf confident, if you like, in its, in its coming ascendancy and in, and in its potential to rationalise the world according to its interests, inter individuals could almost unproblematically reduce the totality of, existent, of the existent to mathematical formulae, to geometry, in the case of Spinoza. But in German idealism, uh, a kind of bourgeois angst appears, argues Lukács. The problems of a reified structure of consciousness really start to emerge. The need to rationalise the whole, the demand for a, a knowledge of the object, for a knowledge of the objective world, for the reason behind the objective world is still there. But now this demand is unravelling attempted philosophical systems. This, argues Lukács, is most apparent in Immanuel Kant's uh, concept of the thing in itself. Uh, which Kant establishes as a barrier to cognition. We can have knowledge uh, of the material world, he says, but it is always limited. We can't know things as they are in themselves. Likewise, the ultimate substance of knowledge, uh, that thing, if you like, which will round off the system, uh, which will make it into a whole, you know, God, soul, is also unknowable. What Kant does effectively is to express the dualism of subject and object as an intractable problem, as just how it is. The world to be known confronts the knowing subject ultimately as something alien, something for, forever beyond his cognition. Lukács is clear about what this signifies. He writes, it is the intellectual expression of the objective situation itself, which, is a, which it is a philosopher's task to comprehend. That is to say, the contradiction that appears between subjectivity and objectivity, modern rationalist formal systems, the entanglements and equivocations hidden in their, in their concepts of subject and object, the conflict between their nature as systems created by us and their fatalistic necessity distant from and alien to man is nothing but the logical and systematic formulation of the modern state of society. 
men erect around themselves in the reality they've created and made a kind of second nature, which evolves with exactly the same inexorable necessity as was the case earlier with the irrational forces of nature, more exactly the social relations which appear in this form. And it's at this point that Hegel enters the picture. Hegel almost comes along as Lukács' saviour. He refuses, Hegel refuses to accept the dualism of Kant. In some ways, he sort of pushes it to its extreme. Uh, he, he turns the opposition between subject and object into something productive, into a dialectic, a dialectical relationship between subject and object. And key to this, and it is key to history and class consciousness, I think it's probably the concept of, of totality. That is the total process in which the different aspects of the whole are created and acquire their meaning. Consciousness now ceases to stand apart from the static, reified world of already existing facts, of things. Rather, it seeks to grasp, consciousness seeks to grasp what is in the conceptual... Consciousness seeks to grasp the conceptual process of its own becoming. That's the right tool. That's it. Consciousness seeks to grasp what is in terms of the conceptual process of its own becoming. And the subject becomes the self-consciousness of the object. But the problem with Hegel's dialectics for Lukács is that it lacks an actual subject, an actual historical agency. Rather, Hegel works with a conceptual mythology, a world spirit which objectifies, it, uh, objectifies itself. Uh, a, world sp a world spirit objectifying itself, which only becomes clear, only becomes self-conscious after the fact, when the philosopher sets about doing its understanding for it. And now we get to the point where Lukács attempts to overcome the antinomies of bourgeois thought, the point where the oppositions between subject and object, ought and is, form and content, are overcome, potentially. The point where reification, where the alien, object-like appearance of the social world can start to be dissolved. And that point, of course, is, as Lukács puts it, the standpoint of the proletariat. What enables the proletariat potentially to grasp the object world as its own creation, to grasp substance as subject, is its position in the production and reproduction of social reality. That is, as the totality of labour under capitalism, the, pro the proletariat is both the subject of the reified reality, creating the objects which circulate as commodities, and the object of the reifying processes of reality, being itself a, uh, being itself a commodity. For the proletarian's labour is not just labour, it's also the labour of alienation, creating not just use values, but exchange values, surplus values, the very, thing which, the very things which appear to have a life of their own. And it is because of this split between subjectivity and objectivity induced in man by the compulsion to objectify himself as a commodity, writes Lukács, that the situation becomes one that can be made conscious. And further on, the proletarian's consciousness is self-consciousness of the commodity the self-knowledge, the self-revelation of capitalist society founded upon the production and exchange of commodities. Now, this isn't simply a, a theoretical shift. It's not simply a, a theoretical insight. It's, it, it, it has a practical consequence. It's a practical shift, too, in becoming aware of the subjective nature, the objective forms of existence. Um, Consciousness changes this alien reality into a social uh, reality, writes Lukács, a set of processes susceptible to conscious transformation. So as Hegel's idealist uh, dialectics attempted to capture the movement of history in the to and fro, the interaction and interrelationship of concepts, so Lukács' materialist dialectics seek to capture the tendencies of history, to make, to make them conscious, to draw out the promise of the forces of production, if you like, and free them from the fetters of the relations of production. There was no trace of bad utopianism anymore in Lukács here, no positing of this kind of ethical end, this uh, uh, redeeming end point for which the proletariat is a mere means. Rather, as he puts it, uh, the, the proletariat has no ideals to realise. When its consciousness is put into practice, it can only breathe life into the things which the dialectics of history have forced to a crisis. Now, none of this is simple. Although Lukács makes it seem at points, despite the kind of conceptual difficulty, despite the terminological abstraction of his arguments, he actually does make it, he can make it seem like, a, like an ingenious process. He can almost seem like he's out Hegeling Hegel. Um, but he, he knows that none of this is simple. Uh, the position of the proletariat in the productive process, the subject-object of commodity production, 
makes itself uh, become self conscious, makes itself uh, become self conscious the mediations by which reality is reproduced. Um, that is only an objective possibility. That's what he calls it, an objective possibility. This is key. A self-conscious proletariat, uh, class consciousness, a self-conscious uh, proletariat is not an inevitability. Um, it's not automatic. Yes, the proletariat can grasp the whole of social reality and seize it in practice, but that is just an aspiration. It is just as an aspiration uh, towards totality. It's not inevitably destined uh, to become total or totalizing. Hence the importance Lukács puts on the dialectical method. That is the struggle to grasp, to become conscious of the categories of mediation, which in practice becomes, become levers of mediation, mechanisms through which the proletariat can gradually dissolve the reified appearance of reality, melting and turning facts into things, into, uh, mel melting and turning facts and things into processes. Lukács writes, the overthrow of reification will be a laborious process. History is at, is at its least automatic when it is the consciousness of the proletariat that is at issue. And this is why, this is why Lukács will conclude history of class consciousness with a demand that consciousness acquires an organisational form, which is the party. And this happens, of course, in the culminating and concluding chapter of history of class consciousness. Now, I'm going to stop there. Um, I think largely because there's a point at which history and class consciousness almost disappears uh, over the contemporary horizon. Um, Maurice Merleau Ponty, in The Adventure of the Dialectic, uh, said it was part of something he called the Marxist sublime, uh, a point at which in the early 1920s, such was the revolutionary um, impetus of the time, that reality really did seem to be coming. Uh, self-conscious, you know, with a history-making subject, tearing down all that was solid, uh, grasping facts as processes, uh, the objective present as a subjective moment of intervention, and leaping with some resistance towards the realm of freedom. Um, and I think it's because of its historical specificity, because it belongs to this almost utopian moment, that I don't think you, you can use history and class consciousness uh, as a guide for today, a, you know, a kind of manual. Um, what it can do, I think, is, is shed light on, almost on, on the fatal dualisms uh, of the contemporary moment, uh, the sheer absence of, of a self-conscious mediation of objective reality, a relapse into fatalism on the one hand in which history, uh, let alone the economy, seems to continue according uh, to its own laws, um, and on the other hand, in which there just seems to be empty wish fulfilment or kind of a Jeremy Corbyn-like hope on the other hand. And unfortunately, with Jeremy Corbyn, I'm going to end. <laughs>